Welcome to our Curious Amalgam, the weekly podcast brought to you by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Our Curious Amalgam explores the fascinating and increasingly overlapping world of competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law. Each week, we bring you leading global experts on the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome to Our Curious Amalgam, the podcast from the American Bar Association Antitrust Law Section. My name is Christina Ma, and today's topic is, What Does Antitrust Counsel to United States Senator Do? A conversation with Mark Metter. There are many different ways of being an antitrust lawyer. One would not usually think of working on the Hill as one of them, but that is exactly what our guest today does. Official title, Antitrust Counsel to Senator Mike Lee. In this episode of Our Curious Amalgam, we'll get an inside peek into the role and practice. Joining me today is my co-host, Matt Michalowski. Matt, who is our guest today? Today, our guest is Mark Metter. Mark is Deputy Chief Counsel for Antitrust and Competition Policy to Utah Senator Mike Lee, ranking member on the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Competition Policy, Antitrust, and Consumer Rights. Mark has also worked in private practice and is an enforcer uh, for both the FTC and United States Department of Justice Antitrust Division, and he served separate stints on detail to the Senate Judiciary on behalf of each agency. Mark, welcome. Thanks. Great to be here. So, Mark, you have a really interesting job. We want to hear all about it. But I thought maybe first we could just start with um, what is the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Competition Policy, Antitrust, and Consumer Rights? Um, What are its functions and its purpose? Sure. Uh, So apart from the actual substance, it's similar to any other subcommittee uh, that you would have on a a full committee in the House or Senate. It's focused, obviously, on antitrust, uh, a little bit broader uh, ambit there with competition policy and consumer rights. But the idea is to focus on legislation and oversight having to do with competition and antitrust matters. Uh, Those are the two large buckets. So legislation, pretty straightforward, looking at bills that have been proposed or preparing bills for consideration by the full Senate that deal with competition policy or changes to the antitrust laws. Uh, and then oversight to keep track of how the laws are being enforced, how the agencies are being run, um, how good of a job they're doing to enforce the laws. Do we need to make changes um, based on what they've seen? Do we need to make changes the next time somebody is uh, appointed to to lead one of the agencies? Um, so those are sort of the main categories of, of things we look at. Okay, we'd like to unpack uh, sort of your role in each of those functions, legislation and oversight. Uh, Maybe we could start with legislation. Uh, What is your day-to-day job uh, to do with legislation? Yeah, uh, it's a very timely question because before and after this uh, recording, I'm going to be looking at bills and preparing for uh, a hearing to talk about a few of the bills that have been proposed. Um, So I, I basically serve you know, as a lawyer to Senator Lee as the ranking member on the subcommittee. So I'm providing him counsel and analysis and advice uh, on what comes before the subcommittee. So when it comes to legislation, that would include reading proposed bills, um, providing feedback then on this is how the bill is written. This is how it would work. This is what we would expect it to do. Here's how it might interact with other existing laws. Uh, You know, here's how we could expect courts to interpret and apply it based on how they've applied pre-existing or similar laws. Um, and then also, you know, when necessary, if, if the senator wants to introduce a bill uh, to accomplish something, you know, helping to draft that up and provide guidance uh, on how we might structure and approach that topic. And in doing those functions, uh, how do you interact with your counterparts for other senators or um, uh, I suppose in the other chamber? Yeah, I mean, there's there's quite a bit of interaction. Um, a, as you can imagine, uh, it's a very collaborative process. Um you know, maybe sometimes a bill is written within one office and then it gets introduced and you have discussion later. But uh, more often, you know, there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen even before a bill gets introduced. So frequently, you know, you will coordinate with folks from other office. There's if you can make something bipartisan, that's always the best approach. So, you know, you'll try to think of who would be a good partner on this bill, who who is another member who has sort of interests or an approach that's aligned with uh, the senator that you work for. And you may reach out and say, Hey, we're thinking about doing a bill to do X. What, you know, what are your thoughts? Here are the ideas that we have. Uh, and you start collaborating and thinking through how to approach it and balance sort of the, the different interests that might be there while focusing on what you can accomplish that's the same. Uh, so that'll be you know, a lot of coordination uh, within the Senate with other offices. But then 
as you alluded to, it, that can also include coordination with folks in the House. Um, you know, if you're really serious about a bill, that's something you usually think about is who's going to introduce the bill in the other chamber of Congress. Uh, and so that you'll think about that ahead of time and reach out to maybe, you know, if I work for the ranking member on the Senate. I might reach out to, uh, you know, my Republican counterpart in the House uh, and say, you know, what do you guys think about this? Is this something you might want to partner on? Um, so there's definitely a lot of, of coordination among different offices, both drafting a bill and then at, at a minimum, after you introduce something, if you're trying to move it forward and through the process, there's there's a lot of uh, collaboration, right? Because then you're you're working with people who might agree with the approach of the bill and others who you know have concerns or have questions or outright oppose it. Uh, and that's where a lot of the work gets done is trying to hash out a compromise to deal with people's concerns while still accomplishing the goals that you had uh, with the bill. Uh, and you know, depending on the uh, ambitions you have for for the legislation, it can be quite an extensive and, and complicated process. So this is an area of law that's um, garnered a lot of attention, not just in the U.S., but abroad. And there are th there's legislation being considered or passed in other jurisdictions. To what extent are you sort of thinking about what other countries are doing and how that may impact uh, legislation in the U.S.? Yeah, that, that absolutely comes up, uh, I, I'd say, in two ways. One is sort of a um, you know, a parochial concern, right, that you, you want to make sure that what's going on in other nations isn't going to negatively affect what's going on here. Um, you know, the elephant in the room here, right, are, are the big tech companies. Uh, those are all American companies. And when you have uh, foreign governments attempting to regulate them, you know, you start of it's a little bit of a turf battle, right? Uh, and if not a turf battle, you at least want to make sure that things are consistent. These are global companies, their services span the entire world, uh, you don't want to have inconsistencies that are going to be disruptive. So that definitely plays a factor. You know, I've been in meetings, right, with my counterparts from the EU who come in to share what they're doing and make a pitch for us to do something similar. Uh, and that gets right to the, the second bucket, which is, um, you know, when you're, we've seen many proposals in the United States that are explicitly designed to mirror what's being done in Europe, for example. Um, as you can imagine, there are uh, some very different approaches to legislation and governance generally that uh, that come up. Um, so you can't always fit a, a round peg into a square hole. But um, yeah, that, that definitely plays a, a role when we're thinking through what are the options on the table and how do we balance all the interests at play. I'm curious, you said that um, obviously you're, you're a lawyer to Senator Lee, that's your title. Um, is there any sense though in which you're, you're sort of performing tasks for the the subcommittee uh, writ large, or how does that work? Yeah, I mean, my so my uh, relationship is primarily with with Senator Lee uh, and advising him in his role as ranking member. Um, but then, sort of, I guess, on behalf of him, we we do try to to work for the whole subcommittee. Right? There's multiple members on the subcommittee. Um, one of the main ways that that comes up is. Well, I'd say there's two. One is, you know, when we have hearings, uh, subcommittee hearings, I will help prepare a, you know, a memo that goes out to the staffers for the other members on the subcommittee to say, here are the issues that are going to be discussed. These are the witnesses. You know, here's what we expect them to say, uh, and try to provide background information so that they are then equipped to go and, um, you know, prep and brief their bosses to prepare for the hearing. Uh, and then related to that is, you know, I think on both sides of the aisle within the subcommittee, uh, especially in the antitrust subcommittee where we have, um, we're, we're fortunate to have subject matter experts that have practiced in these areas of law, uh, staffing the, the members who lead the subcommittee. We kind of serve as in-house experts for others, right? So it's not uncommon that someone from another office will come and say, hey, you know, what do you think about this? And, and not even in the sense of what does Senator Lee think, but, you know, what have you experienced? How does the law treat this? Or what, what do these issues look like within antitrust law as they're trying to kind of get up to speed and provide their own counsel and advice to their boss? Is any of this similar or different to what you did um, in your role as um, what, when you served on detail from the enforcement agencies? Yeah, I've done. So I've done two details. Um, the first time I worked in the Senate uh, was a detail from FTC um, and then later did a detail from DOJ. Uh, and then I sort of segued into my current role from that DOJ detail. Um, but it's been essentially the same job. Um, it might be a, you know, a few 
less strings attached. It's it's always a little weird, right, when you're still uh, an attorney for the federal government, but then you're kind of on loan to someone else and you're you're their attorney. Um, so there's no ambiguity now, but it's been the same job um, the whole time, pretty much. So Mark, we spoke a little bit earlier about your role for the subcommittee writ large versus sort of your role as an attorney for Senator Lee. Uh, along the same vein, are you thinking about state-specific concerns, um, perhaps state legislation to address similar issues that you're thinking about? and how that may um, affect sort of your day-to-day engagement with other senators and congresspersons? Absolutely. That's a great question. Um, As you'd expect with having two senators from every state, you know, the state level concerns are very much in the mind of of every member. um, And they frequently come up uh, as we're looking through federal solutions. Um, You know, not not usually uh, saying like, oh, this is a problem we should kick down to the state legislature and say, hey, you deal with it. Though at times that, that is the right answer. Um, but more so trying to keep track of what's going on in the states, what kind of legislation is percolating at the state level that might inform uh, federal legislation, or maybe there's a conflict we have to navigate. Um, But even more so, I would say, you know, the actions of of state attorneys general are are very important, especially on the Judiciary Committee. That's going to be relevant to a lot of the topics we deal with. And uh, everyone is aware that there's been a lot of antitrust action uh, at the state level recently, and that has certainly played a role in how we think about issues. Um, you know, I can say, for example, Senator Lee introduced a bill to deal with competition in the digital advertising market. Uh, that bill was very much informed by things that came out in the complaint that Texas filed against Google, right? So those, I think that's a good example of how action at the state level can end up informing what happens at the federal level. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think you always want to make sure that, again, you're acting consistent with what's going on in your state, um, and when when decisions come up as well, right, if there's a bill for consideration in the Senate, it, it's not at all uncommon for a member to hear from the attorney general or, you know, someone from the state legislature saying, hey, here's what we think about this at the local level. Here's what we've seen. You know, we think this is a problem or we think this isn't a problem. You know, you might want to take this into consideration as you're considering how to vote on this or how to pursue this topic. Um, and I think that's something that happens quite often and is usually very helpful, actually. So, Mark, I wonder if we could use a recent example as sort of a case study to illustrate um, day in the life for you working on legislation. Um, the merger filing fee package from last year, which included the State and Trust Enforcement Venue Act, originally introduced by Senator Lee in the Senate, right? Could you um, explain sort of how that came to be and how that is either um, a good example of how the life cycle of a bill typically works or as maybe um, a unique case? Yeah, I'll uh, I'll try not to lapse into some PTSD here. Uh, it's actually it actually is a, is a very good example. Um, I know we, we joked before, I'm not going to sing the, the Schoolhouse Rock song about how a bill becomes a law. Uh, plus, that's only it's only like a third of the story. So I, I, yeah, I think that's a great example. Um, so these bills were introduced. Um, well, let me back up. So we had three bills that ended up getting passed last Congress, uh, kind of as a package. There was the Merger Filing Fee Modernization Act, which updated the HSR fee schedule. There was the State Antitrust Venue, State Antitrust Enforcement Venue Act um, that allows state attorneys general to benefit from the same exemption that federal forcers have from being consolidated in a different venue. Uh, And then there was a a bill introduced by Senator Cotton that requires merging parties when they submit their HSR filing to disclose any support or subsidies from foreign entities of concern. Um, So the first two of those bills were really the ones that got a lot of attention. Um, And, you know, the initial stages are what we all know. Uh, Somebody writes a bill, they introduce it to the Senate or the House. It gets referred to a committee. Uh, at the committee level, you may or may not have a hearing to look at the bill and examine it. Uh, eventually, you have uh, what we call a markup, which is basically a meeting of the members of the committee to which the bill has been referred, where uh, members can speak on the bill, voice concerns, voice support, uh, and introduce amendments to, to change the bill and fix whatever problems they think might be there. Uh, and then everybody votes on the amendments. Eventually, you, you work your way through. Once everyone has spoken as much as they want, introduced all the amendments they want, they've all had votes. Um, then there's a vote on the bill as amended. 
if it passes, then it gets referred to the floor, to, you know, to the full Senate or the full House, uh, where eventually you try to get a vote. Um, I think it's at that last part. Maybe folks don't realize uh, how much more goes into it. There's often a lot of uh, wrangling and negotiating, even after something is out of committee, to make further amendments or changes. Um, and then there's some practical uh, practical issues that can slow things down. So um, the each chamber of Congress sets its own rules, right? And um, as lawyers know, right, rules... Uh, often have a lot of impact on substance. Uh, and so, you know, the rules in the Senate, for example, have to do with how much time does each bill get for debate on the floor? Um, how many votes do you need to end debate? Uh, all of that. And so to actually get a bill from a referral out of committee all the way to a floor vote takes a certain amount of time. And the practical result is that, uh, and this is the same with nominations and anything else the Senate votes on. The practical result is, there is literally a finite number of things that Congress can do in any congressional session. Um, there are only there's just there's only so many hours in a day. There's only so many days a year that members can be in D.C. rather than visiting their constituents in the state. So there's only so much time that can be spent going through debate and then conducting the votes. So you really it's not unlimited. There's only a certain number of things that Congress can do. And so when you refer a bill to the floor, it's getting matched up against every other bill under consideration, right? And there are priorities um, that it's everything, right? It's all of the, everything in politics, uh, everything in the government, the, everything that Congress is trying to do all has to be ranked and everything has to be prioritized as to, you know, what's the most important um, and for the party in charge, what are their priorities? What do they want to do first? Uh, and so when you, you throw a bill out into that, uh, you know, morass of everything else going on, that's what you're subject to. And that's, there's this whole other process of trying to wrangle and get a vote for your bill and, and do all of that. Um, but as you can expect, uh, there are some shortcuts that we'll often try to do to get around the lengthy process. One is passing a bill by unanimous consent. Uh, we were actually able to do that with the, uh, the venue bill. Um, simple process where you, you come out and a member will just offer up a bill, uh, say, I'd like to basically deem this passed by unanimous consent. And if nobody comes to the floor to object, it's passed. You can dispense with all of the debate and the time requirements. Um, so that's the preferred way to handle things when they're pretty uncontroversial. Uh, we were fortunate to be able to do the venue bill that way. Um, and then I think a lot of people know, you know, if you can't do that, if you can't go through, go through regular order. Um, a common thing is at the end of the year, when you have a, a must pass spending bill, for example, is you try to get your bill tacked on as an amendment, like get it inserted in that. Um, and again, if something's pretty uncontroversial, that that might not be too heavy of a lift. Uh, and so that's ultimately how these three bills were passed as they were added to the omnibus spending bill at the end of last year. It sounds like quite the process. And also something that requires a lot of skills you probably sort of have collected over your long career. And when you were describing that, I was like, this sounds like for me, you know, a merger kind of coming together and negotiating with all these different stakeholders and having a deadline and wanting to close by, you know, sign by a certain time. Um, I'm sure in, in there, there's a comparable uh, situation working for the FTC or DOJ. So can you talk to us a little bit about your path? into this role and how all of those experiences have sort of helped you in, in your current role? Definitely. Um, so I began my career at the Federal Trade Commission um, and I was there for a total of about five years. And so the last year of that, I was detailed. Um, when, uh, when I moved to, to DC to take that job, my wife asked me, you know, do you want to work in the government for your whole career? Do you want to go to private practice? What do you think? You can like, move around. Um, you know, what's your plan? I was like, eh, I don't know. We'll see. Although, you know, it, I would really like to work on the Senate Antitrust Subcommittee. Uh, you know, just sort of threw that out there. Like, I knew it was a thing. It sounded interesting. I've always been interested in in law and policy. Um, and so I was sitting at my desk at FTC one day and an email came around that said, you know, Senator Mike Lee is looking for a detailee to work with him on the subcommittee handling antitrust matters. Uh, and so, you know, my hand shot up, I fired off my resume interviewed and, and was fortunate enough to, to get that opportunity. Um, and I remember at the time thinking, okay, this is going to be fun. 
I'll do this for a year and then I probably need to go back. And there's this, I felt like it was a dance where you kind of have to keep one foot in the, the policy side of things, uh, working on a hill and one foot in litigation and the actual practice of law. Um, and I, I think that's true to a certain extent. Um, but as you know, I actually think that the skill sets overlap quite a bit. Um, and there's a reason there, there are a lot of lawyers in Congress uh, and, and a lot of lawyers on staff, even outside of some of the committees. Um, and that's because I think a lot of the skills are the same. A lot of, you know, the same sort of uh, tactics and strategy that can be effective when you're negotiating a deal or, you know, working on a trial uh, come into play navigating the political process. And, you know, I, just like you said, you know, you negotiate a second request. Uh, it can be very similar to negotiating with somebody, someone from another office, right. Who's on the other side of the aisle, you have divergent interests. You're trying to achieve different things. Um, the general skills of being able to negotiate and, and manage relationships, right. Uh, are very important. Um, I think similar in law, right. We're often, in front of regulators and courts and working with other law firms where we have very divergent interests. Uh, we want to accomplish very different things. We might even be on the other side of the V, but you have to remain cordial and professional and you have long-term relationships that you need to, to manage and protect. It's, it's absolutely the same thing in Congress, right? It's um, you, you try to keep everything professional and, and keep your eye on the long-term goals that you want to achieve. Um, so I, I found that you know my my time my first detail was very helpful when I transitioned to private practice after that. Um, that you know, the Senate was a great opportunity um, to meet a lot of people, right? To meet with a lot of different businesses, uh, and I was a relatively you know young lawyer at the time. I think it was pretty um, exciting in a way that I mean, one I'm I'm sitting there briefing a United States senator on how a market works. Uh, it was very intimidating the first time, but you know you get used to it, and uh, I think that's an important skill. And then you're meeting with companies, and all of a sudden, the CEO of some Fortune 500 company is sitting there, and he's he's got an ask, you know, from for you that he wants you to see something a certain way, um, and learning how to navigate those situations, and um, you know the all important skill for a lawyer, which is uh, the BS detector, right? You you definitely get plenty of chances to practice that on the hill. Um, so I think a lot of that came in handy transitioning to private practice. Uh, and then since returning to the Hill after, I've been able to see how the experience from private practice doing a lot of those same sorts of things has been very useful uh, in, in dealing with, with folks on the Hill again. Thank you, Mark. That was fascinating. And I think that if we could set some of what you just said to music, we could easily outshine the uh, classic schoolhouse rock song. Um <laughs> Would like to ask real quick. We've we've talked primarily about the legislative function. Uh, what is your role in the oversight function? Sure. Um, so there, uh, I think there's a few ways it plays out. Um, I think the one people probably think about the most are the oversight hearings, right? Where you haul in the head of the antitrust division and the chair of the FTC uh, for a hearing with you know the committee members, and basically it's a uh, you know, a job interview after you already have the job, right? How are you doing? We like this. We don't like that. Um, and that's certainly a big component there. It would be, I, I, I consider part of my job to stay abreast of everything going on in the antitrust world, but especially what are the agencies doing? Um, how are they thinking about and analyzing different questions? What kind of cases are they bringing? Are they winning the cases? Um, you know, how are the agencies performing overall? And so that'll come up at the hearings, right? And, and similar to how we would uh, prepare a memo for any other substantive hearing, you know, we'll prepare a memo for an oversight hearing that kind of gives a, a breakdown of, hey, here's what's been going on. These are the current events for the last year or however long it's been since the previous oversight hearing uh, to inform members about what's been going on. And then they can take that and then decide what they want to ask about or what matters to them, what they like or don't like and how they want to approach it. Um, but then there's ongoing oversight. And um, this, I think, folks may not be uh, as aware of, but there's a lot of uh, ongoing communication between the Hill and the agencies. You know, they're pretty proactive about reaching out to us when they have a new initiative to announce or they're, you know, they've just filed a new case, things like that. Um, but oftentimes, if, if we have a question about something, whether it's a concern or, you know, we might be concerned about a market or an industry and say, hey, can you give us a briefing on this? Um, again, you know, 
no non-public information, but just sort of what's your expertise here? How can you help inform our our process? Um, but other times it, there's a concern. We say, you know, we, we saw you did this. We're not sure we understand it. It seems like it could be problematic. Could you talk to us and explain that as well? And so a lot of those are ongoing conversations uh, that can help inform our oversight activity. Quickly, before moving to our fun questions, I wonder if you'd like to give us any uh, predictions for antitrust in the 118th Congress. Obviously, a lot of excitement about antitrust reform in the previous Congress. Um, should we expect more? I can say with absolute confidence that it will be busy again. <laughs> um, we, we're looking to see uh, several bills be reintroduced. Um, we have a, a hearing coming up to discuss several of them. I think we'll have another hearing or two down the road. So I, I think it will continue to be a busy season. Having Congress uh, be split with Republican tr- control of the House and Democratic control of the Senate will obviously you know, complicate things a little bit. Uh, I think the chances for something moving might be slimmer. Um, you know, if it, if it does, it's going to have to be uh, very strongly bipartisan. Uh, but I think there's no doubt that antitrust will continue to be an important topic of discussion on the Hill. Right. Well, Mark, uh, thank you for all of this. Um, very insightful, uh, you know, behind the scenes look at your role and the work that um, Congress is doing. Um, before we let you go, we do ask all of our guests a couple of questions. Um, you've already described to us a bit about sort of your path to your current role. I think it's a role that's probably interesting and appealing to many of our listeners. Um, so if you have any advice for young lawyers who are looking to do what you do, what would that advice be? Yeah, um, it's kind of a lame recommendation, but honestly, it's networking. Uh, it's just getting to know people, establish relationships. Um, if anybody wants to reach out to me, I'm happy to have coffee or talk to any young lawyer that thinks this might be an interesting job and, and talk to them about it. Um, but so much, and, and this is as you would expect, right? So much of what goes on on the Hill comes down to relationships. And so, you know, one of the best ways I tell people, if you want to get a job on the Hill, the best thing you can do is have a job on the Hill. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, but in all serious, like knowing somebody up there who can tell you like, Hey, there's an opening here. Like a lot of this isn't publicly posted. Um, but you know, for antitrust lawyers specifically, I think the detail process is a fantastic way to get experience on the Hill, especially because it's, it's safe, right? Like you can do it for six months or a year and then come back if you don't like it. Um, or you can be like my counterpart who's been up here for, I think about five years. Um, some people go native. Uh, I guess I'm, I think you're our. I think you're our first guest to have invited our listeners to reach out to you. So I'll be interested yeah. to see the, the hit rate on that. Um, I may regret that. We'll see. <laughs> uh, and now um, our final segment, what we call the Curious Hat. And now it's time for the Curious Hat. So you spoke a lot about what you do between the hours of nine to five or perhaps nine to eight or whatever your hours are. Um, what is your favorite pastime to do in your free time? Well, when I have free time, <laughs> uh, something I've really gotten into lately actually is ham radio. Uh, so I am a licensed amateur radio operator. Um, I've been doing that for a couple years uh, and enjoy, you know, trying to see how far around the world I can reach and connect with folks and um, yeah, recently had some conversations with people over in Europe and uh, South America. Um, it, it's pretty neat. I've been enjoying that a lot. That's very cool. Sorry, you said you're licensed. Yeah, wow. so you have to uh, you have to take a test uh, and uh, file for a license with the Federal Communications Commission, uh, and they issue you a, a call sign that you use, and uh, it's fairly regulated. Um, it's not too bad, but. The most intimidating part is like, you know, you have to have uh, an analysis done on your station to ensure that the RF is at a safe level and the proximity to where you sit and all this kind of stuff, which sounds wow. a lot more complicated than it is. But so it's uh, mostly it's a, a technical it's a license or do they actually like want to make sure you're not going to go talk to someone in South Africa and say something inflammatory? <laughs> no, uh, I mean, there's like <laughs> there's general expectations that, you know, you don't talk politics on the air or use profanity and things like that. But um, no, it, you take a test. It's mostly technical stuff about like calculating volts and amps and watts and the power output of a radio and how signals propagate through the ozone and, and things like that. 
Very cool. I'm very happy we asked that question. Um, Mark, thank you again for your time today. And for all of our listeners, thank you for listening to this episode of Our Curious Amalgam. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Our Curious Amalgam, a competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law podcast. It is produced and shared around the globe by ABA's Antitrust Law Section. The opinions expressed by the participants in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent their employer or other organizations. If you like what you heard or would like to become a member of the American Bar Association, please check out what the Antitrust section has to offer at ambar.org antitrust. You can learn more about our podcast at at ourcuriousamalgam.com. If you have comments, suggestions, or podcast ideas, please reach out to us at podcast at ourcuriousamalgam.com. Until next time, thank you for listening.